The Dwarves, written by Marcus Heights and narrated by Fairy Princess Lolly. Chapter 1 Enchanted Realm of Ionandar, Girdlegard, Spring, 6234th Solar Cycle. A volley of raps rang out as the hammer danced on the glowing ore. With each blow, the metal took shape, curving into a crescent as the iron submitted to the blacksmith's strength and skill. Suddenly, the jangling ceased, and a pair of tongs swooped down and tossed the metal back into the furnace. The blacksmith gave a grunt of displeasure. What do you think you're doing, Tung Dil? The waiting man demanded impatiently. Iden, a groom in the service of La Ionan, the Magus, stroked the horse's nose. The nag can't wait forever, you know. She's supposed to be pulling the plow. Tung Dil dipped his hands into a pail of water and used the brief hiatus to wash away the grime. The dwarf wore leather breeches and a brown beard clipped close to his chin. He was naked from the waist up, save for a leather apron. Running his brawny fingers through his long, dark hair, he shook out the sweat and let the drops of cool water trickle across his scalp. The shoe would have never fit, came his brief response. He pumped the bellows, producing a tortured hiss like the breath of a wheezing giant. The air breathed red-hot life into the glowing coals. Nearly there now. He repeated the procedure this time to his satisfaction, and fitted the shoe to the nag. A foul-smelling cloud of yellowish smoke enveloped Tyndale as the iron singed the horny sole. He dunked the shoe into the pail, allowing the metal to cool, then held it to the hoof again and drove his nails through the holes. Setting the hind leg down gingerly, he retreated hastily. The animal, a strong, broad-backed gray, was too big for his liking. Iden sniggered and stroked the plow horse. How do you like your new shoe? He asked her. The smith's a midget, granted, but at least he knows his stuff. Just watch you don't trip over him. He hurried from the forge and marched the horse toward the fields. The dwarf stretched and gave his powerful arms a shake as he strolled to the furnace. The groom's jibes did not rile him. Teasing, affectionate or otherwise, was something he was inured to, having grown up in Ionandar, the only dwarf in a human realm. He stood more chance of finding gold by the wayside than encountering another of his kind. All the same, I should like to meet one, he thought. His gaze swept the orderly forge taking in the rows of tongs and hammers hanging neatly from the walls. I'd ask about the five dwarven folk. The light in the forge was dim, but Tungdil liked it that way, because it brought out the beauty of the fiery coals. He worked the bellows, chasing sparks into the chimney as he fanned the flames. For a moment, his face lit up as he imagined the glowing red dots flitting through the sky and taking their place in the firmament to shine brightly as stars. It was the same satisfaction that he derived from letting his hammer bounce up and down on the red-hot metal. Do real dwarven smiths do things differently, he wondered? Why is it always so dark in here? Without warning, Sunya, the eight-year-old daughter of Frala, the kitchen maid, appeared at his side. A bright child, she was refreshingly untroubled by Tungdil's appearance. The dwarf's kindly face creased from ear to ear. It was astonishing how quickly human children grew. The girl would soon be taller than he was. You're as bad as cats, you children, sneaking up on me like that. I'll tell you all about it if you help me heat the iron. He tossed a lump of metal into the furnace. Eagerly, the fair-haired girl joined him at the bellows. As ever, he pretended to let her take over allowing her to believe that she was compressing the firm leather pouch with her strength alone. Soon, the metal took on a reddish glow. Do you see now? Reaching forward with the tongs, he gripped the nugget of iron and laid it on the anvil. It's not for nothing that I work without light. A blacksmith needs to know when the metal has reached the right temperature. Left to slumber in its toasty bed of coals, 
the iron overheats, but raised too soon, the brittle metal can't be forged. Tungdil was rewarded with an earnest nod. The child looked exactly like Frolla. My mother says you're a master blacksmith. I wouldn't go that far, he protested, laughing. I'm just good at my job. He winked at her and she smiled. What Tungdil didn't mention was that he had never received instruction in his trade. Watching his predecessor at work had been all the training he'd needed. Whenever the man set down his tools, Tungdil had seized his chance to practice, mastering the essentials in no time. Now, 30 solar cycles later, no job was too big or too difficult for him. Lost in their thoughts, Tungdil and Sunya watched as the flames changed color. First orange, then yellow, red, white, and blue. The glowing coals sputtered and crackled. Just as the dwarf was about to inquire what Cook would be serving for luncheon, a man appeared in the doorway, black against the rectangle of light. You're needed in the kitchens, Tungdil, came the imperious voice of Jollison, a famulus in the fourth tier of La Ionan's apprentices. Well, since you asked so nicely, Tungdil turned to Sunya. Be sure not to touch anything. On his way out, he pocketed a small metal object and then followed the apprentice to the vaults of La Ionan's school. Two hundred or so students of all ages had been selected to learn the secrets of sorcery from the Magus. To the dwarf's mind, magic was a slippery, unreliable occupation. He felt more at home in his forge, where he could hammer as loudly as he pleased. Jollison's dark blue robes billowed as he walked, his combed hair bobbing about his shoulders. Tungdil eyed the youth's fine garments and coiffure and grinned. The vanity of that boy. They entered a large room, and an appetizing smell wafted towards them. Sure enough, cooking pots were simmering and bubbling above the two hearts. Tungdil saw at once why his services were required. The pots were suspended on chains from the ceilings, but one of them had slipped, and its pulley was sitting in the flames. Lifting the vessel required more strength than a woman could muster, and none of the apprentices were willing to help. They considered themselves a cut above kitchen work, refusing to dirty their hands or burn their fingers when the others, such as smiths, could do the work. The cook, a stately woman of impressive girth, hurried over. Hurry, she cried anxiously, reaching up to stay her escaping hairnet. My goulash will be spoiled. We can't have that. I'm starving, said Tungdil. Without wasting time, he marched over to the hearth, touched the chain lightly to gauge its temperature, then seized the rusty links. Cycle after cycle at the anvil had strengthened his muscles until even the heaviest hammer felt weightless in his arms. A pot of goulash on the pulley was nothing by comparison. Here, he said to Jollison, proffering him the grimy chain, hold this while I fix it. The young man hesitated. Are you sure it's not too heavy for me? He asked nervously. You'll be fine, Tungdil reassured him. He grinned. And if you're half as good at magic as you say you are, you can always make it lighter. He pressed the chain into the apprentice's hands and let go. With a muttered curse, the famulus threw his weight against the dangling pot. Ow, he protested, it's hot. That's my goulash you're holding, the cook reminded him darkly. Conceding defeat to her hairnet, she allowed her brown mop to fall across her pudgy face. I don't care if you're a famulus. I'll take my rolling pin to you if you let go of that chain. Her plump arms rippled as she balled her fists. On discovering the source of the problem, Tungdil decided to punish Jollison by delaying the repair. This won't be easy, he said in a voice of feigned dismay. Frala raised her pretty green eyes from the potatoes she was peeling, saw what he was up to, and giggled. At last he made the necessary adjustments and checked the mechanism again. 
The pulley held and the goulash was safe. You can let go now. Jollison did as instructed, then inspected his dirty hands. Some of the grime had transferred itself to his precious blue robes. He shot a suspicious look at Frolla, who was laughing out loud. His color rose. That's exactly what you were hoping for, isn't it, you stunted wretch? He took a step toward Tungdil and raised his fist, then stopped. The dwarf was considerably stronger than he was. Angrily, he stormed away. Tungdil watched him go and smirked. If he wants a fight, he shall have one. It's a pity he lost his nerve. He wiped his hands on his apron. Frala fished an apple from the basket beside her and tossed it to him. Poor Jollison, she said with a chuckle. His fine gown is all soiled. He should have been more careful. He shrugged and strolled over. Like him, Frala was responsible for the little things that contributed to the smooth running of the school. But I'll excuse his clumsiness, just this once. His kind eyes looked at her brightly from among his laughter lines. You two deserve each other, Frolla sighed. If you're not careful, someone will come to a bad end because of your feuding. There was a splash as she dropped a peeled potato into the waiting tub of water. What did he expect when he dyed my beard? You know what they say. Make a noise in a mine shaft, and you're bound to hear an echo. Tungdil ran a hand over his stubbly beard. I had to shave my chin, thanks to his stupid spell. He must have known we'd be sworn enemies after that. I thought orcs were your sworn enemy, she said archly. Well, I've made an exception for him. Beards are sacred, and if I were a proper dwarf, I'd kill him for his insolence. I'm too easy going for my own good. He bit into the apple hungrily. With his left hand, he took something from the pouch at his waist and pressed it into Frolla's hand. For you. She looked down at her palm and saw three horseshoe nails painstakingly forged together to form a homemade talisman. She stroked the dwarf's cheek fondly. What a lovely gift. Thank you, Tongdil. She got up fetched a length of twine, threaded it through the pendant, and knotted it deftly around her neck. The talisman nestled against her bare skin. Does it suit me? she asked coyly. Anyone would think it had been made for you, he said, thrilled that Frolla was wearing the iron trinket as proudly as if Gerdlegard's finest jeweler had designed and forged the piece. There was a special bond between the pair of them. The dwarf had known Frolla since she was a baby, and had watched her mature into an attractive young woman who turned the heads of La Ionin's apprentices. These days, she had two daughters of her own, Sunya and the one-year-old Akana. Cycles ago, when Frolla was still a girl, he had made tin figures for her to play with, showed her around the forge, and let her work the bellows. Dragon's breath she used to call it, as the sparks flew up the chimney, accompanied by her laughter. Frolla never forgot the pains he had taken to entertain her, nor how he cared for her daughter. She shook the remaining potatoes into the tub and topped up the water. As she turned round, her green eyes looked at him keenly. It's funny, she said with a smile. I was just thinking how you haven't changed a bit in all the cycles I've known you. Half of Tungdil's apple had already disappeared. Still munching, he made himself comfortable on a stool. And I was just thinking how splendidly we get on together, he said simply. Frolla, the cook shouted. I'm going for some herbs. You'll have to stir the goulash. The ladle, its stem scarcely shorter than Tungdil, changed hands. The cook hurried out. You'd better not let it stick, she warned. A delicious smell of goulash rose from the pot as Frolla gave the stew a vigorous stir. All the others look older, she said, even the magus, but you've stayed the same for 23 cycles. How do you think you'll look in another 23? The topic was one that Tungdil was reluctant to consider. From what he had read about dwarves, 
it seemed he was destined to live for 300 cycles or more. Even now, it grieved him to think that he would see the death of Frala and her daughters, of whom he had grown so fond. With these thoughts in mind, he popped the apple core into his mouth. Who knows, Frala, he mumbled, hoping to dismiss the gloomy subject. The maid had a particular knack for reading his mind that morning. Can I ask you something, Tungdil? He nodded. Do you promise you'll look after my daughters when I'm gone? He choked on the sour apple pips, scratching his throat in the process. I don't think we need to worry about that now. Why, you'll live to be... He looked her up and down. A hundred cycles, at least. I'll ask the Megas to give you an eternal life. And Sunya and Akana, too, of course. Frala laughed. Oh, I'm not intending to meet Palangiel quite yet. She kept stirring dutifully even though her forehead was dripping with perspiration. But all the same, I'd, well, I'd feel better if I knew you were there to take care of them. Her shoulders lifted in a helpless shrug. Please, Tungdil, say you'll be their guardian. Frala, by the time you're summoned to your goddess, Sunya and Akana will be old enough to look after themselves. Realizing that she was in earnest, he duly gave his word. I'd be honored to be their guardian. He slid from the stool. If the chain slips again, send Jollison to find me. He made his way out with a small bowl of goulash to sustain him until lunch. On returning to the forge, he found Sunya waiting for him, with yet another commission from Aiden. Two wooden barrels whose iron hoops had split. No sooner had he started to work than the plow was brought in, needing urgent repair. Tungdu relished the work. The fierce flames and physical effort made it a sweaty business, and soon perspiration was trickling down his arms and plopping into the fire with a hiss. Frala's daughter watched in fascination, passing him tools whenever she was strong enough to lift them and working the bellows with all her might. The glowing metal yielded to his hammer, letting him shape it as he pleased. At times like this, he almost felt like a proper dwarf and not just a foundling raised by humans. His mind began to drift. He had reached the age of 63 solar cycles without seeing another of his kind, which was why he looked forward to being sent away on errands. The occasions when Law Ionin required his services as a messenger were regrettably few and far between. There was nothing Tungdil wanted more than to meet one of his own people and learn about his race, but the chances of encountering a traveling dwarf were infinitesimally small. The realm of Ionandar belonged exclusively to humans. There were a few gnomes and kobolds, but their races were almost extinct. Those that remained lived in remote caves beneath the surface, emerging only when there was something worth stealing, or so Frollo said. The last of the elven people lived in Ollander, amid the glades of the eternal forest, while the dwarves inhabited the five ranges bounding Girdlegard. Tungdil had almost given up hope of visiting a dwarven kingdom and finding out about his folk. Everything he knew about dwarves stemmed from La Ion's library, but it was a dry kind of knowledge, empty and colorless. In some of the Magus' books, the writers called the dwarves groundlings and poked fun at them, while others blamed his people for opening Gerlagard to the northern hordes. Tungdil refused to believe it, that he could understand why so few of his kind ventured outside of their kingdoms. His kinsfolk were almost certainly offended by such prejudice and preferred to turn their backs on humankind. Tungdil was putting the finishing touches to the first of the iron hoops when Jollison appeared at the door, wearing, as Tungdil noted with satisfaction, a clean set of robes. Hurry, he spluttered, panting for breath. Don't tell me it's the goulash again, said Tungdil, grinning. Why don't you run along and hold the chain until I get there? It's the laboratory. Barely able to get the words out, Jollison resorted to gestures. The chimney, he gasped, turning and hurrying away. This time it sounded serious. The dwarf set down his hammer in consternation and wiped his hands on his apron. 
Once Sonia had been dispatched to join her mother in the kitchen, he chased after the famulus through the underground galleries hewn into stone. Hello friends, this is Gone for Hammerhands. Thank you for checking out Fairy Princess Lolly's channel. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe button. And if you'd like to support these magical creations, fly over to our Patreon and join the fairy family. Safe travels!